dubbed this generation's Conrad Hilton for his focus on driving results in hotels through bringing his second chances and hope to disenfranchised and forgotten communities. The general manager of the 209 room Double Tree by Hilton in Reading, PA, and president of Reading Hospitality is a two time Hilton Connie Award winner, Hilton CEO Light and Warmth recipient, and an AHLA general manager of the year. Craig Poole, thank you so much for your contributions to hospitality oh, thank and you. for sitting down with Hospitality MD today. How are you this morning? I'm excited to be on this with you today and to see where we're going. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think like you've been somebody that I've looked up to for quite some time because I've heard about the things you've been doing in the community and your your approach to hospitality seems to transcend the hotel Um which it's what we're about here at Hospitality MD. Um, and and it's, and it's great to see you living that life on a daily basis. Um, what's the first memory you have of feeling hospitality from another individual? Oh my, uh, first one ever, probably. The first one that you can remember. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, at a restaurant when I was probably 13 years old in Pittsburgh. We were out with the family and I remember um, back, in, this was in the 50s. So there wasn't that many restaurants and the restaurants that were out there were cafeterias and smorgasbords. And we went to a really nice restaurant in uh, Pittsburgh and I got treated with waiters and great service and great food. I remember getting a prime rib and I, when they put the prime rib in front of me, it was the size of what pot roast would have been when we were children for family. <laughs> so, and I think that was one of the highlights of my beginning. Do you think it had anything to do with, you know, you said you were 13 at the time, the fact that somebody was treating you with that kind of dignity and um, and respect as a 13 year old child, even though you probably weren't paying the bill, you know, you were just there to eat. Did, did that have anything to do with that at the time? Well, I could, but well, you could still remember it that many years later. Um, what I remember and what I've tried to continue doing is it was the experience. My grandmother paid the bill, it was her experience. It was a family experience. And then we had this experience given by the waiter with great service that was selfless. And I, when you could go back this many years, I, off a of cuff, I didn't have this plan to say that to you. Um, <laughs> so what I got into was the experience business and hospitality was my vehicle. So what is it about experience and what does that mean to you uh as you're a hotelier as you are a community activist what does that experience mean to you specifically well a lot um the way i kind of paraphrase it to people now is some people in the hospitality business they work on the business hospitality meaning they run a hotel as a business period and there's people like myself and you, we work in the business hospitality where it's, we're studying it, we're living it. It's in our, we wear a heart on our sleeves. Um, our soul is out there at all times and we're passionate. Many people today, too many people today are in this business uh, and they forgot the passion behind it. They forgot the, that we're here to serve other people. They're coming to your hotel to beat you. You're the, you're the manager or you're the front office manager. Or they want to know you. They don't just want to stay in a hotel. So I, I would say that uh, I've capitalized on that because it's weak. I made it an experience in our, anywhere I've ever been. And I brought success with me. Called, it's called relationships. <laughs> it's just making great relationships with people. You can make a great bed, you have a great hotel, you have great TVs, you can put millions of dollars in a hotel. But people remember the people first. 
if you have the prettiest pool and they have a bad experience, they remember a bad experience. Right. And I think you touched on something really, really important, which is, you know, that, that sentiment of, of you running the hotel as a business and, you know, you're working in the hotel business. Where do you think that passion that people have goes astray? I mean, you've had 50 years in the business. I'm sure you've seen this happen to maybe friends, colleagues of yours, other people, um, where you see that their values start to shift. And at what point do you see that start to happen where on a career basis, like, is it when you get to a certain level that you start to see this happen? Or is it after you've been in the industry for a certain amount of time? Like, do you see a pattern with that? Or do you think it's just a part of innately who you are? Like, if you're truly hospitable, you'll never be that way. Right. I believe that if you're truly hospitable, and there are some of us left, or some of us like you coming, you're going to carry it with you forever because it's, it's, it's your joy. It's your passion. It's, it's your artwork. Um, people, where do they fail is one, success is the enemy. Um, I'm very successful, so now I don't have to do this anymore. No, what got you there is why you're successful. So don't quit doing what you did. Do it better than what you did. Um, but too many people uh, in today's world, they want to get promoted. I want to become the general manager. Then I want to become the regional. Then I want to become the vice, vice president. And their focus isn't on the guests. It's on themselves trying to get where they want to get. I've spent a lifetime on the guests and the employees. I would say a lifetime on the employees for sure and the guests. So my day is different than a lot of people's days. If you, if you work 12 hours or 18 hours a day or like my days are typically are probably 12 or more now. They used to be a lot more uh, until recently because I got a little bit older. <laughs> but I don't work. It's, it's a lifestyle for me. It's a, I want to see the people come in. I want to see them in the morning. I want to welcome them. And I want to thank them because without them, I have nothing. I'm not fulfilling my purpose. And the purpose so, of, and, and I'm not leading people the right way. That That's honestly like fascinating to hear. So you, you come in and you're saying like basically first thing in the morning, you're out there in the lobby, you know, basically yeah. saying goodbye to guests as they're heading out and thanking them for staying at the hotel and representing the property as the general manager and just representing hospitality, I guess. Right. So uh, I'll answer that. So every day, just about every day, I show up around 637 because that's when the guests are here. And I try to meet everybody at the elevator. Now, the two things happen here. I meet with the sales director of sales. I meet with an engineer, myself and some other people that work here that want to come in. And we gather there every morning. And we talk and laugh about what happened yesterday, what's going to happen today, personal lives. Uh, and while people are coming down, we're saying hi to the, the guests coming out of the elevators. Did you get breakfast yet? Can I get anything for you? And they're telling us two things. Are happening. One, we're bonding, continuously bonding as a group of people here. Um, and we're building this relationship amongst ourselves of how the day is going to start. And we're meeting all the guests. So if there's an issue there, I have the engineer, director of sales, and myself. And we can, if there is a problem, we can resolve it. The great thing, if you do this enough, you don't have problems, you have encouragement. So now you're going to get more food every day, encouragement food. You're doing a great job. This is outstanding. And people say, I've been a hotel, I'm a diamond member, I have two, two million points. I've never seen people like you in the lobby thanking us all the time. The second, the third part of this is, I call it my farm. And I, as people are coming down, I'm finding out why they're here, who they're with, what companies are around, what's building. Um, so probably, I'm um, probably one of the best sources for economic development in the city, because I know before anybody knows why people are here shopping for land or a business. 
and then I can relay that to economic development, and then we can put that into a city and get to be a build a business, get their their employees, and also get all their business when they come here and all their banquets. I've done this most of my life, and I did pretty good, um, pretty pretty successful in hotels that were never successful. So I just take the same formula. And would you say that that's a big part of it? Is is that kind of routine in the morning by not only it's almost like you're having like an informal stand up right by the lobby in the elevator or right, right by the elevators in the lobby. Uh, right. You're still talking, you're conversing, you're getting guest feedback, which most of the time is positive because after you do that for so long, your problems are going to shrink for guests. I mean, it, it only makes sense. So now your team is getting constant positive feedback from the second they walk in the door from the, the people that they're serving. And, and would you say that, uh, for example, say you take over a property and that's something that has never been done before. Can you see the transformation in your team from the time that you start doing that? Let, let's just talk, and by team, I mean like, say your director of sales and your engineers. Like, like, let's take these two people who are there in the lobby with you every morning. When you first get there, maybe the hotel isn't run very well. You know, you're coming down, hey, how was everything with the guests? Did you have breakfast yet? Yeah, you know, breakfast was subpar, whatever. They, you know, you have criticism when you first start out there. And over time, those that feedback gets better and better. And can you see that transformation in just those two team members alone? Uh, well, I made a lifetime living off of that exact situation, going into broken cities with broken hotels. This is the first hotel uh, since 1980 that I helped open brand new. All the all my the rest of my career has been uh, bankruptcies. Um, they're going to lose their their flag because of guest scores. And um, but let me say something before I go there. I, I went off track. We went off track for one minute. I just want to finish one thing about the morning. Every employee, everyone that's here in the morning, I meet. Everyone I greet. We have a bump, a handshake, a high five, a chicken wing, a hug. <laughs> Uh, whatever that communication, because it's about relationships. So my relationships start with coming in the morning and making first the relationships with everybody that works here. Are they okay? Do I want them here that day? Is there something wrong with them? Can I help them? Are they are they in a bad mood? Do I need to remove them? Because I don't allow negative in my building. I don't allow any time, ever. So it starts at the beginning of the day. If I don't have the right employees here, I'm not going to have a right day. Then I go to the farm, the front door, and we meet people. And, and, they, and the guests teach us what we need to know. They tell us this is the shower head's not working here. This, there's something not right with this room. But if you do this enough, you don't have problems with those rooms because they're telling you how to fix them. But you don't know that if you're not there. You could read a SALT score or a TripAdvisor. It's too late. And you can fix it when it comes in too late. But what about, the, what about all the situations that happen that nobody reports? They're ongoing and ongoing. So for me, I call the front, the, our meeting, the point of impact. That's the number one place to be. As long as you can be there is be at the point of impact, the center of influence. People think the center of influence is an office. I don't spend time in this office, maybe a half an hour a day, maybe. I don't, I don't even think a half an hour, because I do a lot of my work in the lobby, if, I'm, if it's quiet, because there's people coming in, or I'll find a soft couch to sit on, and I'll make phone calls. But I don't do it back here, where I'm sitting right now. First of all, I don't like it. Uh, I trained myself probably 30 years ago to quit going to offices. You know, I make more business on a bar stool than I'll ever will on a on a uh, an office chair and like I'm sitting on it in an office. I don't make anybody here. <laughs> I don't make any input, and I don't even like it. I feel like I'm in a cage. But people need to get out. Uh, they they forgot to get out. So it it starts with relationships with your help first. 
people at work I want to I want to address something you said um, because you said do I want this employee here today right and I'd like for you to elaborate on that because my instant first reaction is of course you want that employee here because if it's not here we're going to be understaffed and then this is going to happen in this and then it just it snowballs tell me about your perspective on that sure who has the power so a negative person somebody that's behind somebody that's angry they have a lot of power and they can remove that power from you in a minute um because they're now at the point of impact with other people they're you're not with them uh but eventually, if they're in your business, you're going to be with them with a group of people that are angry. So I don't allow anger in a business. I don't hire angry people. I coach people. If they're in a bad mood, go home. If you're always in a bad mood, you don't work here. I tap you on the shoulder. Uh, I constantly say a smile. I mean, I don't. I do things that we talk about. And this is always have a smile, 10, 20, or whatever, 5, 10. I actually do it. So I took all the things that we've learned growing up in the business and all the things that are out there, all the fluffy things, and I turned them into reality. And because I'm out there always doing it, I'm always getting it back in return for the, the help. What happens out of that? Well, first of all, you win a lot of awards. Secondly, everybody wants to come back. So now you own the market share, 156% uh, Repar Index three years in a row, four years. This is our fourth year as of last, yesterday was our fourth year being open. So four years. We're oh, congratulations. Thanks. Um, in, in the second poorest city with the second highest crime rate, uh, where there's nothing's, wow. been, nothing's been built in the city since 2091 was the last time something was built. It had no heartbeat, it had no soul, it had no pulse. We brought the heartbeat, the soul, the pulse back into here. And now it's it's getting ready for revitalization. And it's all happening right now because we've had four years to work on that through the culture here. So we set a new quality of um, hiring, legalities, all the right things you're supposed to do, health, insurance, and the culture of changing people that have been uh, marginalized and minimized and now people are interested in coming downtown so uh just to just to pull some statistics here because you mentioned the crime rate and everything like that i so you moved to reading in 2010 correct uh, right you did your homework tried to tried to right. so you moved right. to reading in 2010 and right. Let me let me just make sure I'm not butchering these statistics here. So in in 2010, the poverty rate was 41.3 percent of the population in Reading. In 2017, that number is 30.7. So you have a 19 percent year over year um, decrease in in the the poverty rate over time since you've been there in the city. Do you? can you and will you take any credit for that do you think that you have anything to do with that or that your hotel has anything to do with that because those those numbers look look like it's already heading in the right direction right um poverty is a result of loss of hope and the only difference between poverty and non-poverty is cash <laughs> and and that's all hope and it's all being legal. So a lot of the poverty numbers are under the table money. So you have to help a city to become legal again. So they pay their taxes. So it then gets reported as cash. And you have to make people legal. Um, here, I hired, um, we have 225 people that work here in a 209 room hotel. Think about that for, that'll be another, that's, that'll be something to talk about. Absolutely. We have 27,000 square foot of banquet space that we're running out of. So we're looking for another property to expand some catering into nearby. We do just in catering in a, in a minimized city, 
the second poorest city in the country. We do over seven million dollars in food and beverage. Uh, that's a lot when you're when you're charging the prices we're charging. We don't have Chicago prices and New York sure. prices. We have poverty prices. Uh, so it's a lot of people to go through. So you need a lot of people. We hired 200 people that are walk to work, meaning they're all in the same um, zip code. These are people that never, that were in the second poorest city, now running the number one double tree in the culture. So I'm only a person that their lives have changed drastically. Their health has changed drastically. We, I tell people that great food isn't just meant for rich people, it's meant for poor people. So here, every day, the people here get a, a buffet of healthy foods for free, as much as they want. And if they have, if they're in a, a bad situation at home, if they're heading to a homeless situation, if there's evictions coming up, we'll help take care of the families for a while with their food and housing sometimes. In poor cities, people eat poor food. They eat foods that give you diabetes, um, obesity, heart, heart problems, and just bad health. So our job is a bigger, the bigger purpose here was how do we change a city? We have a, running a hotel isn't hard. Changing a city is a little bit harder. So we use this as our catalyst to change a city. And that's, and, and so we are very successful with that. We have a university that's going to move one of their major schools about four blocks away from me. Um, that's going to bring a whole university climate. It's going to bring housing, uh, which never would come here. We had a, just had a brewery open. We had a distillery open. And we might buy a, another restaurant real close by. Um, and I met with somebody last week about a possibility of a boutique hotel in the near future, maybe two or three years. So we're looking for, a, you know, going to historic building type Hilton brand. I love it. Now, Craig, like we're seeing, you know, we're seeing these results uh, in the community. We're seeing, you know, people's lives changing. Um, and, and that's great. But do you have people who say, um, how can you feed somebody's family? We, you know, that's not in the budget. We didn't, that's not in the PL. We don't have the money for that. Um, oh, we can't put that room out of order to house this person's family because they're homeless, because, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's one less room. We're sold out these days during the month. How can we do this? Does anybody ever challenge you on that? Or have you ever had to fight that battle with somebody where, well, so we own and operate the hotel, so nobody fights us. Okay. <laughs> so if this was a corporation, they would be fighting this. You're right. right. But they would be wrong. Because it's a corporation, because somebody's a president or vice president, doesn't make them the smartest person in the room. They're not at the point of impact. They're not at the center of influence. I work under the theory that everything happens right here. If I do this right here, I'm going to make a lot of money. What happens? This, here's a real quick, how do you make money? I don't have any workman's comp. I don't have any turnover. I don't have any uh, lawsuits. I don't have any INS problems. I have nothing because I made sure that I took care of this. We give our employees 80, 80, 20, 80. Well, we pay 80%. They pay 20% of Blue Cross Blue Shield because healthy people are, are great. When you treat them great, they don't turn over, they treat you great, and they, and they create, remember how I started this, they create great experiences for people. People pay for experiences. My rate is, I, with, I don't think anybody's within $30 of my rate. I have the highest occupancy in the market. Why? Because people are, don't get this. In the downtown area, the, there's nothing around me yet. And we own the market. We own the market for 108 hotels from Lehigh Valley through Berks County. And we have the market. Um, Do people come to your hotel 
because of the legacy that you've already built with these with these right. team members is that yeah. a drawing point to your property it's a mark 100 percent. it wasn't i knew if it worked it was high risk because we we um i'm very vocal and outspoken about hiring second chance so i have 60 some people that have been in the prison system and i know because i don't want to do what normal people do i want i want to create great experiences for them and i want people to come here and have this experience knowing that this guy was a, in, in prison for 20 years and and i love them they love these people and um it changes their lives the guest lives it's not just stay in a hotel i want to have an experience where i helped this man me this hotel us to grow and to to employ people because this is what i want to do too there's a lot of people that were doing what they wish they could do so they're doing it precariously through me or through what through us i get an opportunity to speak a lot uh lately or for a while and most of the time if it's local i will say and thank you for being here today and thank you for su supporting us because when you support us, I can hire more people and get more people off the street and out of the prison system. What prison you've system. done, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. So, a, a, so just, I've been working in this for, since, for many years, 30, 40 years. So I get it. And they like the stories of gangs. They like that I was involved in Crips and Bloods and Latino Kings. And I get to tell stories and I have them tell the stories. I bring them with me. Um, so they can, they can see somebody who was in prison for 20 years, who was in a gang, who did some bad stuff, who's now out and now they have a 4.0 at a college and they're going to a, a, a junior college. This just happened. And now they're going to go to a four year college. And, uh, so people see, remember hope, but what changes people hope? What changes the audience experience? It's a, it's a hotel that creates hope and experiences for I mean, everybody. You've really created um, something for the guests that they want to be a part of. Um, and I think on the flip side for the employee, like I it immediately kind of what ran through my head was, you could probably get away with doing something like this similar in like, uh, you know, I'm sure charitable organizations do it all the time, you know, where they have people, they have them volunteer, try and give them a sense of purpose in their life. Yeah. But, but what that, what's not happening is those people are not contributing to a real business in, a, in their real city that they've been living in to make real money, to spur the real economy and, actually make a real impact on the world and on real people. Um, and I think you've used the hotel as a catalyst for that, for these people. Um, and I'm sure you have, I mean, like you said, you have 220 employees, right? At a 209 room hotel. Why? Let's talk about that now. Why, why so, why so many? I need to change lives. I need to create great service. So let's take 50 some years in this business. And I'm going to go back. Uh, I'm not going to try to make this long, but before the mid 70s, this is what hotels did. They hired a lot of people and they've created great experiences and they did a great job. And people came back and they paid pretty good rate and occupancies were high. Of course, all given, all given I, I live in that world. So all of a sudden, this thing called shareholder value came up in the mid 70s, which I, which 100%, I get it. I, if they don't have shareholders, they lose the, the business that people are out of work. And they had the gas crisis in the 80s and some, uh, some depression, um, recessions going on. The problem was they never went back to employees that stay shareholder value. So for, it's, it should have reverted. I reverted when I had the opportunity. I went to people value, 
relationship value, customer value, and that it makes more money than shareholder value thinking. A lot more money. I make a lot more money ever than a person that's running a hotel based on a shareholder. They got it, they got it upside down and they, they haven't corrected it. So I see that and I said, okay, if, I, if that's what everybody else is doing, I think it's wrong, my world, my right to think you're right or wrong. But I've been vice president of companies. I own some uh, hotels and some restaurants. Um, I never sold myself out. Well, I should say that. I sold myself out and that's where I didn't like myself because it changed the value. Tell me so, about that. Tell me well, about that. Because I think, I, I just want you to tell this story so maybe any of our listeners who are in a similar situation or could be facing that can kind of see well, the foresight a little bit. Sure. How could you, my theory is, how could you be saying you're running this big hotel company? Uh, by the way, I have hotel companies, big hotel companies coming here now to study us. So okay. that's, so we're very thankful. I have one with probably has, I would say a hundred hotels and they're sending their um, human resource, the whole human resource department in uh, shortly to study why we were, who we are. So, so that chairman of the board of that company saw me speak at Hilton and he liked it and he thought, okay, I want to make a difference too. So I, so we're, our goal was not to change our lives, but everybody's lives if we could, particularly lives in, in an urban area so that people don't get marginalized and beat up and talked down to. So let me go on to that question now. We, the question was about hiring people. Is that right? Well, you know, I, I wanted to know, um, kind of, you said you sold yourself out at one point. I did. I, well, I, I would, wanted, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. So, I was the vice president of a large holiday Inc. when I was incorporated. And we ran a third of the country. We were the mega regions back then. And we sat at a table with, a, 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 I don't know, maybe a dozen people. And the president was there and all these other people. And we went out to dinner the night, that night to a place in Washington, D.C. That's where our offices were. And we spent $2,000 for dinner. And, Everybody got presents in their rooms. They flew in and everything was first class. The next day, we're sitting at a table talking about races. This would have been 1984 or five. And these are good people. And we used to give races of 5, 10, 20%. 20% was not uncommon to get a race back in the 70s and early 80s. We're giving 3% or 2% raises to people that lived in LaGuardia, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., you know, $90 uh, a year. And I said, how can we sell, how can we do this to people? I said, we fly around in private jets, we go wherever we want to eat, we spent all this money last night. What, if we added up all we're giving a races day, it's not what we spent last night for dinner and uh, for a whole hotel. And I thought I was on a great roll and I, I got uh, put down and I thought, okay, uh, I don't belong doing this anymore. I, I don't belong in an arena where people are thinking about them and not the people that work there. And what happened, and I was right, because what happened was all of a sudden you saw less people working more, they're working harder, driving people harder, they're burning the, the housekeepers out, they're, we went from from 14 rooms to 16 to 18. So pretty soon, if you could get a housekeeper and, and have her work 30 rooms and pay her, you were, you're gonna get promoted. <laughs> and I thought, are you crazy? You're gonna have work as comp, you're gonna have burned out people, they're not gonna be happy. Nobody's happy when they're burned out. General managers, you know what they do when they burn out? They go home, but they don't mind burning out a housekeeper or a cook or a dishwasher. So what I was doing was equalizing that. Um, I left and we bought uh, th th three franchises from um, Holiday Inn. They were called Hampton Inn. So we built the 18th, the 21st, and the 32nd Hampton Inn privately. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we were the pioneers of that. But I didn't have to, re guess I reported to me. And I liked that guy. 
because I had a heart and a soul and I wasn't being driven by somebody's uh, values if they were my values uh, and I didn't want to change them. And then I bought a restaurant in a blighted area of Pittsburgh, uh, bankrupt, and it became one of the top jazz clubs in the whole in the whole world for 17 years. Same thing. Uh, I did the same thing. I hired locally. I built this thing. And nobody went there. Nobody went in this area but gangs. That's why I got involved in the gangs. And then in the 17 years I had it, I had two presidents there. It's every movie star. They recruited the Steelers. It, it was recognized uh, globally for uh, this massive jazz club. We did a thousand people a night in the inner city of Pittsburgh that uh, nobody would go to. I thought, okay, that worked. Um, the stay in the inner city thing. I went to Rolly, I went to Rolly Meadows out in uh, Chicago, 400 or 500 room hotel. Horrible, just horrible. Um, the, it was it was unionized, and the your the head of the union back then uh, came out with his people to meet with me. We met in a room with his his people, whatever they were called. And he said, we know why you're here. You're here to take the union out. I said, you know what? I'm here to sell a hotel. That's my, old, my only purpose. You can't have INS. You can't have lawsuits. You can't have union disputes. So you're safe. I said, but you have a problem because you're not treating your union right. Because if you think I can take it out, and I could, I'm not, it's not my intention, but you need to change how you treat your people. Uh, and this was only in a year. So you can go, I go anywhere. I think anywhere in the United States that's bad and fix it. When I came to, to this city, the hotel was, I, don't know, I think, 172 in the brand. It was 162. It was going to lose its flag. There was going to be a walk-off, and it lost $3 million. In four years, with the same type of thinking, take care of the people, take care of your sales director, meet all the guests, because the guests are going to tell you where it's wrong. The guests are going to tell you what to do right. We went from 170, 162 to 10, no capital, zero. I took it right out of the cash flow. And we made, uh, was negative three. We made a million in four years. Same thing. How do you do it with no money? With people. So you get your people excited. What's the purpose? Why are we here? For, well, we built revenue up, first of all. Yeah, I know. Uh, revenue's everything. So we, we were able to, because we were out meeting the people, trusting us, we were creating experiences and dreams for the market. And they moved their business over to us. And we got this reputation going within a few years. Um, got it quickly, but it... Um, it was all about the guests and the, and how does it and have putting the right people in the right spots in the hotel. Uh, we had to get fire a lot of people because they're the ones that cost a lot of money. They were angry, so if you were angry, I fired you. It's real, it's real easy. I, what's my purpose here? To create great experiences with happy people. You can't do it with angry people, so I just get rid of that. A couple of lawsuits went later. Uh, we're making money again. Can't be afraid of a lawsuit. You got to be. Uh, afraid of going out of business. So we flipped that and uh, that hotel did pretty good. Uh, but it's all about people. I, I could go to Chicago tomorrow and take a hotel, I'm sure. It, if I can do it, and I don't do anything that's hard, everything I do is, uh, is rep repetition. The key here is that's what people tell me is, you have to be authentic in what you're doing. So it's it's you have to be authentic. It has to be purposeful. Chris Nassetta with Hilton. I like this man. Um, I read his story. I, I liked him. And then I read, I watch what he's doing um, closely because he's a great leader. He does purposeful management. He's got it. He's trained, he's using the soap and care and everything he does, there's a purpose. So Hilton people that want to, you want to be successful, you should ride on his purpose. This is a purpose. 
I want, I show up at a hotel, I create a purpose for it. And everything drives that purpose. I met with, a, I'm going to take it outside of a hotel. I was with someone this morning on the phone from Detroit. And it was about a housing in Detroit and a purposeful living and community. And I said, you know, if you focus on housing as your purpose through the mayor, through the community, through your business, just like if you here, we focus on growing a community and the hotel will rise. It's got to be greater purpose than a hotel, greater purpose than being a front office manager, because then everything is working in harmony to move the community. Just this morning, it was uh, we talked in Detroit. Uh, same thing. I said you, you, you got. If you focus on house, if you focus on healthcare, safety, police, blah blah blah, you're not going to fix anything. But if you focus on housing, now there's a purpose. Now all of a sudden, safe, safe becomes the housing. Safe becomes health. Safe becomes everything. And it all leads to housing. Then education leads to housing. Now, here we have financial mindfulness classes because people were poor. And then when they're poor, they don't move to a city. They don't move to a city, the school taxes are too high, then the, the education goes poorly. If they're Wait, poor, I'm they sorry. Get, Do you have that at your hotel? You have these I have, classes. A, I have one today, about 12 people coming because we're paying them to change the city. But if I give you money, and um, so this, I have a lot of people here have been promoted. So I'm going to say 30 people are now managers that were never managers before. They're number one in the country. They should be promoted. I don't need to hire somebody outside. If you're already number one, why would I look outside? That's what I tell them. So they keep seeing promotion. And they keep want to work uh, and, and learn more and be a learner. So we teach learning. The, I'm gonna to get to the financial education. Everything here is a learning. So uh, there's no such thing as you did something wrong. It's love the child, hate the act. Move the person, focus on what, what happened. Well, she did this, no, 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 no. What is the act? Let's focus on the act. If you, if you fix the act, the, it'll, it, the people, we pull the people away. Right. So now they're moving up and they're making, let's say they made 10,000 a year or $10 an hour when they came four years ago. And now they're making 50, 60,000 a year now. They're just as broke because it's the same habit, the same behavior. So we have to change their behaviors. Um, so the problem is financial awareness is the behavior. Uh, we we said, well, this called financial. Uh, oh, there was a name for it. I said, and nobody showed up. I said, this call uh, was called. We first it was called financial literacy. Nobody wanted to sign up because it said literacy. <laughs> okay, I get it. So this changed it. Financial mindfulness. We had twelve people show up. They ha they have a six week course that they go through. In conjunct, we we bring in a credit union to help us so they get certified. So now I have 24 people that went through this and we follow them through because we're trying to get them to move their credit scores up. So they make wise decisions, get their credit scores moved up to 650 to 700. Why are we doing that? Remember the purpose of the hotel is to change the city. You don't find crime in a 700 credit score neighborhood. You don't find divorce. You don't find truancy. You find truancy and crime and uh, on safe streets and dirty housing and house neighborhoods where there's 350 credit scores. That, so this resolution, how do you, how do you fix that? So we keep trying to bring it down to where, uh, and housing fixes everything, but you can't buy a house unless you have 640 credit score. So you have to understand that. So it's, it's learning. Now, how do I learn this? How did I, how did I learn this? Uh, very easy. I sat with the people who work here. And they teach me, where's their pain? Where's your hurt? We take that same thing, right? I learned from them. They see a customer, where's your pain? Where's your hurt? 
So if you go on TripAdvisor, if you could see our salt scores, you would see lots of people here, many people here, if somebody came and said they were sick, you'll see a trip, you'll see a report somewhere on TripAdvisor that so-and-so brought them a cup of soup to their room, so-and-so drove them to the hospital, so-and-so, they're empowered to take their learning and put it back into the guests. And that creates success. Kind of bizarre. But it works. Okay. So um you said when when somebody does something wrong, it's a learning opportunity. So right. if, how do you tell the difference between an employee who maybe isn't a good fit and somebody who just happened to make a mistake and needs a little bit of guidance? Great question. So an employee if, to get in here, so let me I want good fit. To get in here, you get interviewed by the department head. And you might get interviewed by a couple other people in that department. It might be a coworkers, it might be the assistant or somebody. But to get in the door, you've got to go through the Wizard of Oz. And that would be me. Because I can't allow negative to get into the building. Um, I can't allow it in here. It's, it's, you could be the best employee somewhere else and you could have this, all these awards, but if you don't fit our culture, um, you'll destroy our culture. Uh, so uh, I look at how do you get in here first? And if you get in, I've already decided you're probably a pretty good person. I don't care what you did before. Your background, um, it means a little bit to me. I really hire people based on who they are today and are they going to get me to where I want to get to tomorrow. If they can't get me to today and tomorrow, then I don't want to go there because it's too much work and it's just, it's too expensive and it's a waste of time. So we hire people. That's why I hire, hire people with records. I know a little bit about it, their life, but if I like them and they have a smile and they fit um, my I think I'm smart enough and my intuition is good enough that I could say, okay, this is going to work. And if we love them unconditionally, if, as we do everybody, and we don't carry their past into their future, they will change um, drastically. You know, I don't, I, I have a great success rate with people, little turnover, very, very, very little turnover. So, so the other part of that question that you asked was, how do I tell the difference? Um, first of all, I know them. I know everybody because I, I know them. So I know who they are. I already can be coaching them ahead of time. I know if they, uh, we had one person a day, one of the managers came up and we had a function for 600 over the weekend and a bar back wasn't doing his job right. And I, his name is Danny. And I said, and, um, his manager came and says, yeah, I need to talk to him. I don't know if he, if we're going to have to start looking for somebody. I said, oh, really? I said, who do you think the problem is? Is it Danny or is it, the, why, why, did, wow. why is Danny, if Danny was doing well and he's not doing bad today, this just happened this morning. Do you think it's fair on our failure to help him and not recognize him to fire him? I said, I think you need to look at you first. You're doing a great job, but look at you. Maybe we've hired new people. We're not paying attention to them anymore. If people aren't recognized and appreciated, they go backwards. You will, I will, the customer will also. Recognize and appreciate. I would say that's my key words. Do you have write-ups at your property? Do you have discipline? Uh, I we mean, do. It, go we ahead. do, but we do, but um, not. We have a lot of forgiveness here. Uh, if you're going to be listen, if you're going to be in this business, you can't go around writing people up and all all day long. And um, now, now you're opening up their fear, and now they're not going to move for you. So we write people up when we have to, but we really have to do it. And there has to be a, 
really a serious offense to do it because they make people make mistakes. Um, if I got written up for everything I ever did in my life, it would be it would fill this office with paper. Um, it's somebody's opinion, perception. What's a perception? But if you I can think say that's a very very valid valid point because what is like a write up other than somebody's judgment of you or somebody's uh, somebody's opinion of you that they're almost like a gatekeeper for if this is right or wrong. How is this one person right. being deemed the power over somebody else to tell them that this, this thing that they did was, was so bad that it needed to be put on paper. Yeah. It's and they, be- they, then they look at it and they get reminded of that every single time because they have a copy of it or you send somebody a negative email and then they can read it over and over again. And well, it's just constantly negatively reinforcing something in somebody's mind. So, so for a while, we had a person here that liked to do that. And we had uh, lawsuits, unemployment compensation. We spent our time with that kind of stuff. Uh, the person left. We never replaced that. We learned from that and said, Let's, don't go that same way. That's not the way to do it. I, I compromised my value and let that happen. And it would cost us, you know, maybe $15,000. Uh, that's a lot of money for a compromise. I should have been I should have been read up for compromising. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you know, it was a bad decision. But I did it. Um, but I have to learn from that. And oh, just be careful. Because uh, and I don't have turnover. When you don't have turnover, you have alignment. And when you have people following you and they know that you're behind them, they will do anything for you. You can move mountains. Uh, and you'll make a lot of money. Um, we do. <laughs> you know, we spent, you know, for those of people out there that might be uh, in the finance business, you know, we we spent $67 million on this hotel, on the 209-room hotel, and that's crazy. That's 300 and some odd dollars, uh, $309 or something per key. We, our, our rate in the second poorest city with the second highest crime rate will never be We'll never see 300 and some dollars. It'll never happen. But we, we're we already stabilized. We're already refinancing. Right now, we're going through refinancing. It should close up. It should have closed up a month ago, but it'll close. Many hotels open up. They build a hotel this size for 20 billion, 25 billion, and they're never going to be stabilized because they're always running it for the wrong reason. They, they, they forgot. They forgot why we're here. Um, so part of why I like to do these podcasts is I tell people here, my success here, when I hire them is follow me, you follow me and I will be behind you. That's my leadership style. Hmm. If you follow me, it'll make my behaviors will always grow and learn because I know you're following me and I want you to be great. If I was a to recommend anything that you do in, in any hotel in the world, any business in the world, is follow me. I'm the leader. You have to be worthy of a leader to be followed. The key here is, and I will be behind you, because most people in in hotels, businesses, marginalized cities, nobody's been behind them. So there's a big, big piece of trust that happens. It's so simple that I don't think people will, will do it. But it works. This, it worked, and I tell people it worked for Mahatma Gandhi. Follow me, and we'll go to the sea, and we'll move some salt. He went through some tough times, but he was always behind everybody. It happened to um, Martin Luther King. Follow me. Follow me. And he has to, the, when you're, you have to take the, the beating, you have to take the bruises, you have to, whatever happens, you have, that's part of it. I'll be behind you. That's the key. Uh, if you don't think your leadership's behind you, you'll never give 100%. You'll never make a mistake, which is really bad. And I always, and I always, always use Jesus Christ. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishermen and men. Did pretty good with 12 people. A bad job. Huh? So if you look at, I look at leadership styles, I say, this is what I want to be. I want to be a leader that people are worthy to follow. 
person that if you do follow me, we're aligned and we can move a mountain. And um, that's what I created. Most of the people here followed me. A lot of people here followed me to here, including including most of the guests. From the crowd? So, yeah. Yeah. Most are but yeah, most of the guests. And most of the, and the key people. And I left I left the negative ones behind. Now, Craig, uh, I, I want to ask you uh, one last question here. What is your advice for anybody who is looking to find the purpose and execute on that in their role? Um, Great. Whether Great. that is the dishwasher, the front office manager, the director of sales, the GM, how can we be like you? One, you have you have to find an authentic purpose. It's got to be a purpose that you're not doing it because of Facebook posts and showing up to get an award or your name in the paper. Um, you know, it'll come anyways, but that should never be the reason. It's got to be a greater purpose than that hotel, wherever you're at. If it's to fit, I I use community because that's always a greater purpose, and I'm in it, and I want to be a value to the community I'm in. If we have a, so many acres or so much spot in the city or a suburb, <clears throat> we owe it to them to make an imprint and a legacy for that community and to build a community up. If it's just about the hotel, that's all you're gonna get. If it's just about being a dishwasher, that's all you're gonna get. You'll never get any more. Um, so when somebody, I'll give you an example. If, if somebody were to make a, a, if you went to a waitress here and said, what do you do here? I would hope she would say, if she's been with me for a while, most have, but she would say, I wait tables, but I'm here to change the city already. So now their decisions that they make are greater than being a waiter or a waitress. They're, they're checking the balance that if I do this, How's that going to affect the people that work here, the people that we're trying to improve in the city? And they become a greater part of what you're doing. And, when you ha and now they have a bigger purpose when they come to work and they have more pride and they feel accomplishment. You have to be very transparent. You have to give them, you give them the credit because they are the credit. If you walk around and take the awards, <laughs> then you're, it's, it's you. But, I get a lot of awards, so many, um, but I bring the people with me. So if I go on stage, some two or three people always go on stage. And I always pay tribute to them. And, uh, and a, a man named Albert Boskoff, who had the money behind this whole project, he passed away, but he will always, I'm his dream maker. That's what I tell people, I am his dream maker. And the word dream maker, if you want to walk into the lobby, you'll see people with dream makers um, name tags on. Their, their whole life is to make your dream come true while you're here, whatever that is. Um, so they're empowered. They have a lot of, uh, they can make a lot of decisions. I don't, I don't have anybody ever come to me to say, well, I'm having a fight with a, a, a difference between the guests and myself. Never, never. Well, not in a few years. I I would say at least three years. I haven't had a because it gets resolved before it gets to me, and they're all happy. And and our salt scores are in the high nineties. You know, we're oh wow. Yeah, our salt right now is ninety one point four a year to date. I've never been in the eighties. That's uh, unheard of. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's that's what number one looks like. Here, that's me, what number one looks like. It'll take me too long to pull it up, but let me see. I'll just show you. So it's always uh, 91, 92, 3, or 93 to 91. Uh, I don't think I, I, I would have been in the 80s three years ago. It's not pulling up quick enough. Pulls up, I'll show you. I mean, that is absolutely crazy. Yeah. yeah. Done by people who never did this before. Done by people that are happy being where they're at. Done by people that want to come and make a difference.
done by people that have value, that have self-esteem. You don't rob someone's self-esteem. You don't uh, cost you a lot of money to rob people. Here, look, I just pulled it up. Oh. It's worth looking at because it's fun. And we monitor every one of these guest scores. Every, everybody has this and we celebrate it every day. Um, if there's any issues, it gets emailed to the person to, to try to get resolution immediately. It's going to pop up in a minute. There, 91.4. Does it see? Um, yeah. Here, look. 91.4 experience, 92.8 overall, 92. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we're proud of it. 92.8? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. We and, have, you know, uh, I don't know if um, I don't know if you and, and Greg had had uh, spoken a little bit before I got on about you know the wit actually where he's at and where Greg and I work together was wait wait for a second for oh, a second go ahead that's twenty two thousand three hundred ninety eight guest scores ninety four percent health of the staff ninety percent health of the breakfast so you see helpfulness is the word. And it's, it's authentic. You can't be helpful and not. It's always authentic. Up there. Boom. Take a look. Get that one. This is wow. done by people people that never ate in a place like this before. You but know, I think that's a, you make a great point, Craig, because I think a lot of times management kind of, they get into the whole, uh, trying to motivate like we need to do this because the scores have to get up we need the scores to go up the scores the scores the scores the scores it's never about the scores man the scores just come they they just they just right. the scores don't get to 93 percent for overall service because you said to your team guys we have to get the scores up yeah and you can't do it if they're burned out if they're unhappy, don't ever, people are gonna give you a good score if they're unhappy. I paid all this money and this, but they come here and they get something different. They go to Walt Disney World, they get something different. A lot of people compare this, a lot of, lot of people compare this to Walt Disney. I think it's short-term gains. People are always looking for short-term. You know, did we, did we get our, our labor costs in in line for this week? Did we do this for this week? Yeah. This for this month? And I get yeah. that, but it's like your scores will never be 93. And you'll never have 156, uh, 156 rep part index. Yeah. If if you say we're going to have 156 rep part index, let's do that. Yeah. If you that's have the goal, if that's the goal, you can't accomplish it because that's not a goal worth accomplishing. You know, it has right. to be let's change the city or, you know, let's make all these people's lives better. Let's give everybody a second chance um, and let's be an example for the entire world to follow. Then then you can get those scores. You do. And we're thankful. We're, listen, we're, and, and we're, we're thankful. We're not. We're just so thankful that we can do this. My time in life to get to do this at this point in life is wonderful. It's so uh, we're making a big difference. We're hope hopefully these podcasts will help other people make get a good difference, um, change their lives, change it for their employees. My heart is for the people that live in Alabama or Detroit or Atlanta, and I get phone calls from those uh, general managers. Um, that they want to do what we do. And I said, here's the, here's the problem. I want you to also. But if your ownership doesn't want it, you're not going to do it. And I'm going to paint a picture to you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I'm going to. Please go ahead. I just, that, that really resonated. With I said, I'm going to paint a picture of reality, of my reality, that's going to be opposing to their reality. And you're going to see that it can happen. It's going to destroy you. It'll do you more harm than good. So the best thing to do is when you can speak to the higher ups and they buy in. I have to speak to a lot of um, SHRM groups, human resource, a lot, um, because they're all looking for employees right now. And I said, you're looking at the top 20%. I look at 
100%. So I'm not short of help. I, I can, I, and I have a reputation. This, this is a, it's really not uncommon to get 20, 50 resumes and applications a day here. Um, bank president applied for a job. They want to work, people are retiring and they want to work here because there's a purpose here and there's love here and it's calm. We have a right amount of people to work and it, and it makes money. I mean, I, I don't see why, and, and you're right about long-term money. They, may, they, want to, they want to run a, a sprint every day and we run a marathon every day. And we're not in a panic. If we have a bad month, we learn. Uh, how do we not have as many bad months? And we've done pretty good with that too. You know, we grow every year. This is our fourth year. We've grown substantially. We run, the, our, our biggest problem now is we're full, we run 98% Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, so we're, all we're doing now is we're just knocking off the, the weekends in the inner city of the second poor city with the second highest crime rate. <laughs> and they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm proud. I'm proud that the people here can do it. I'm proud that we were able to lead people to do it. I'm mostly proud that we're trying to show everybody you don't have to hire perfect people. You can help them be perfect, the best perfect they are. And before I get off, I want to say this too. We have at least 20 people um, that have autism, Asperger, Down syndrome, blind. Um, they all have gifts. So if people, and I don't hide my people in the back, I don't give them menial jobs. I have uh, two Down syndrome people, three, four Down syndrome people that are hostesses here. Um, I have some working at banquets. I have one in laundry and I have a new uh, person that's uh, does have sight and he'll be doing, uh, we're finding a, his spot right now. I don't even have a spot. So but. you hired him and you're like, you know what? I know we will we will be able to find your talents, develop it, and yeah. put you in a place where you are utilized for your best abilities. Right. And, and, and right like, now you're not even sure yet. No. But I liked him and he had the personality that I liked. And he had the he had the forward motion that I'm looking for. And he's gonna do great. I can't wait to find out where he's gonna be. And sometimes in hiring, sometimes I beat somebody that wants a job here and I don't have one, but I want them so bad I hire them. And most of the time when that happens, they become great, the greatest employees because uh, I don't let great get by me. Why would I? Uh, it's, you know, you got to have somebody on a bench. You can't have people on a bench if you work at a big corporation. <laughs> Sad for them. They burn out, everybody leaves them. I don't get it. Uh, and I've been that guy at a big corporation, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't there when it got ruthless with uh, when accountants became presidents and controllers became vice presidents. I was there when people who were at the point of impact got to understand the point of impact. And this uh, center of influence, whatever you call it. But, so I'm still doing my thing. Right. You know, it, you left before it got too, too, uh, before your values kind of, oh, uh, I did compromised. And, and I think that's, that's something that a lot of people could learn from is if you are in a position where your, your personal values don't align with your, your, your company, no. change it. I, I had it, but I came back independently back into, I sold my business in 2004 and I, called a major headhunter who everybody would know. And I said, I'm coming back. And he said, he said, Craig, here's the problem. He said, you're gonna, uh, they don't want people like you anymore. He said, you're, I was probably 50, some of your 55 or so years old. It wasn't the age, it was, he said, you're an entrepreneur and people want a robot. They don't want people like you. And I said, but hospitality is still hospitality. And a, and a guy, named Dave Robinson, knew me from my past. And I said to Dave, give me your worst hotel that you have and hire me and let me fix it. And 
worst the worst thing that happens is I I I can't fix fix it that I've, I've been out too long and we fixed it in a year and we flipped it and he got me my start back and um so this guy who said I'll never get a job because a robot called me uh, maybe two or three weeks ago and said is there any way I can talk you into doing something I said no but I said. <laughs> Isn't it funny that 15 years later, you don't want robots anymore? He said, there's too many robots. I said, isn't that funny that that happened? Uh, but I never sold myself out. That's so funny, man. You said hospitality is still hospitality. What are you talking about? And you got laughed at. And now that person is coming crawling back to you because you were absolutely right. And you knew the truth and you knew what was right and you stuck yeah. with it and you didn't let any outside influencers put you astray on what no. your, your values and your mission are. And that is why you could, you have dream makers in the lobby. It's, management companies want to run so lean now. They don't want to have any, any extra staff labor slim. You have dream makers. Like what is that? This position yeah. and, and again, you, like you said, you're never going to see $300 a night on the raid just because of where you are, but you're still profitable. Well, here's the good news. If you see 300 now on weekends when there's uh, pressure because uh, we help build a, a concert hall across the street up. So we're attracting people from New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia and Delaware that they don't mind paying 300 So we do get 300 but not all the time. Well, you uh -huh. made your own 300 that's yeah. for sure. But if, if you were to go on uh, TripAdvisor, look at the hotels in the market, they're, today they're all going to be from 75 to 115. And we're going to be at probably one, uh, we'll be at two, we might be at 300 today because we're sold out. Jeez. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're all being run by people that are tightening up the screws. And they keep tightening them up, and I think, good for you. Uh, tighten them up. Make a bad impression. That's, your, that's, your, that's what you want to do. Make your business. Right. Keep trimming and trimming and trimming, and keep your rate at 75. No memorable experience whatsoever. And and then just, just let your guests come over to my hotel. Not a yeah. problem. Not yeah. a problem. We, a year ago, we were number 28. TripAdvisor sent me a thank you type thing that we were number 28 in all of America's, America's. So I guess that's probably here in South America. I'm not sure. Number 28 in rating in the whole entire Americas. But that's pretty good advertising. I'd say that's pretty good. So because that's walk over story of Beverly Hills. That's, I mean, yeah. that's everything that's conrad midtown i mean that's all these properties and uh and ready the double tree <laughs> reading run by a bunch of bunch of people been, been, <laughs> that's been marginalized we love them i love my people and they know that and you gotta love your people if you love your people you won't fire them you'll coach them if you love your guests you'll help them be successful you won't you'll make special amends to make their success so Whatever it is, I have. I have a few more minutes left. Please, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so we have three vans here. I bought a van when we opened in the downtown area, not near nearest uh, Philadelphia's our nearest airport, which is about an hour and a half away. So, but I bought a van. So I wanted a van, and it's at fourteen. But my goal was that if people stayed here, I would be able to give them a. A dining experience outside of here. We have a good restaurant. The restaurant here does about almost three million a year inside here. It's a great restaurant. Built to fit the clientele that's here. Um, the, but I wanted them to go eat at other restaurants. So we wanted to change the city. So I went with the other, before we opened, I met with these other restaurants. I said, I want to buy a van and I'm going to ship my people to your place to eat. Yeah, because I'm going to have, I think, a million dollar, a million dollars worth of ancillary income that we could spread in the community. If I do this right and you get successful, then you'll buy the business next to you, or buy another business, and I'll start building the city with successful people 
that this was the feeder. I now have three vans. Um, and we transport people all over the city to go eat or have an experience of some, some sort because experiences matter and they count for a guest staying here. You couldn't do that anywhere else. But now my weekend business is at growing and growing and growing because people know that we'll take care of them, we'll shuttle them. Um, if you <laughs> if you were in a company, they would they would you would have you wouldn't have a car in my little van. <laughs> But, oh, absolutely yeah. not. Especially in an urban setting as well. You may yeah, but, hotels don't have shuttles. They don't have cars. Well, that's but, why we. But you're not it. a hotel. You're not a hotel. You're, yeah, we're you're a home. You're, you, it's, it's a home. It's something. It's a home, different. and it's fun, and people don't mind paying for it. So, I tell almost every time I speak, I say, "Do your work so well that when people." leave they're going to want to come back and they want to tell others and bring the others with them so they can show them how well you do it and what happens if you live like that now you, you, it has to be authentic or if if you bring them back and it's not real like they told them you disappointed everybody <clears throat> so you always have to be on your toes if you do it that way it's almost like a salesperson a, our, our business has been brought over from other hotels that somebody stayed here with a, a, a large group of people. They've been staying in a couple of hotels in the area. They had this experience and they came over here and they paid more because they were told by somebody who had a great experience here to come over. It's, I know it's old, uh, old school. People talk about it, but they don't do it right. I was just they, about to say, it's like, yeah, you know, it's it. People always think, oh, that sounds great, you know, like word of mouth, and people, you know, who get enthusiastic, they'll bring other people, and they don't actually believe it because they've never been good enough to actually have that happen to them. But once you get that good at what you do, and it does happen, that's when you know that it still exists, and you can. It's that's what people want to do. People want to go and stay at your hotel. They have a reason for going there. And they want to go and stay at your hotel and then tell other people how great of an experience they had. Right. Hey, you can do this too. You know, but if, it, but if you're, if you're not out there facing the friend or the enemy, when it goes bad, you're never going to know. So these offices are dungeons in my world. Uh, I, most of my people stay out of their offices because uh, nothing good happens there. Nothing good happens after midnight and nothing ha good happens in an office. Except I, I, I don't know what people do. I'm 71 years old. And I'm still trying to figure out what people do in their offices all day long. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't know. <laughs> I think the Joe Mayor's is in the office. I think, for what, for what? What do you, what's in there that I don't know about? I, gotta, I don't want to figure that out, though. I like my life. So yeah. you create your life. You know, create the life you want to live. This is the life I wanted to live, and I made it, and I'm so happy I did it. And I'm going to do it for a lot longer. I'm going to do it as long as I can take this ride. Um, but. And and I I look forward to seeing you continue to elevate yourself. I look forward to all the new developments that you'll bring to the hospitality industry, to the world itself, and, and to uh, the community. And from from me to you, aside from from hospitality MD, and aside from this podcast. Thank you so much for teaching me something today. Well, thank you. I've learned a whole lot. You've inspired a, a young hotelier today, and um, it, it, it means a lot to me. I hope we can keep in touch. Can, can I say one more thing, a couple of things, because I want to be authentic. Absolutely. We, we, we talked about the, I just thought about it when we were talking, The we do the second chance group. So when we donated this weekend 50 really, really nice toys, to families, the children of families who are in prison. So we keep the authentic thinking out there all the time. We don't publish it online. We don't talk about it. But we, you have to stay authentic with everything. It's got to be purposely driven. So and employees raise the money for the 50 people. 
when people come here and apply for a job, they don't have, we know they don't have money, but they have self-esteem and pride. We have a care closet downstairs full of Joseph Banks, Brooks Brothers clothes, uh, I don't know, the women's designer clothes that the community drops off here. They want to play. They, they don't know what to do with it, so they let me do with it. <laughs> so I get the good stuff. And we, if you came in and applied for a job and you weren't dressed right, we met, we, if we want you to be here, we may say to you, would you like to go put a suit on in, in an interview? Because you'll interview better if you feel better about yourself. And if you don't get the job, you keep the clothes because they were donated to us. But we put clothes on all our employees. They go in there anytime and get clothes, lots of, lots of, lots of clothes. So much that and we have so little turnover now that we're giving it to them, which are really nice clothes that you and I would like to wear. They're using those for presents to give to other people for Christmas. So they're giving Joseph Banks, Brooks Brothers, and uh, who's ever else's first class suits, $100 ties, but we're teaching them the art of giving and not getting, because that's important. Uh, and then their self-esteem rises and their health gets better and they show up more and they don't get hurt. I mean, why wouldn't well, we and that? that ripple effect into the city <clears throat> is, is, is even more widespread because that disenfranchised individual who's working at your hotel who can get that clothing to another disenfranchised individual and their family, right. it just keeps spreading that, um, you know, that positivity and, and yeah. that growth to everybody. Yeah. So we do well, little things I, like that. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for, for thank taking you. your time today. Nice I pal. really, really enjoyed our, our conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. I wish you could be on the screen. So I see you and I see a pink spot for Greg, but Greg, you look great in pink. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, well, uh, Craig, I, I really Merry appreciate Christmas. it. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you Merry Christmas. And, and to your entire team. But if I look forward wants, to keeping in touch. Anybody wants to reach out, I don't know how you do that, but um, you can reach out to me. I, I don't know what I can do, but I wear my heart right here, right on that sleeve at all times. And uh, I care about your people and the people in your hotel. But I'm sure they're taken care of. Well, Anyways, thank you. Thank thanks you for so that. Thanks for bringing me out today.